now I'm very happy to introduce to you our first keynote speaker, Mark Ramsey. I'll do that in German and French, since you, dear Mr. Ramsey, perfectly know your own CV. Es ist uns eine sehr große Freude, den US-amerikanischen Medienstrategen, Forscher und Trendsetter Mark Ramsey hier bei uns begrüßen zu dürfen. Zum ersten Mal überhaupt tritt er in Europa auf. Also ganz toll für uns. Mark Ramsey est l'un des plus grands spécialistes du marché, consulté et engagé pour de multiples projets dans les domaines Media, Publishing et Marketing Radio. Apple, CBS, Bonneville et EA Sports ont, entre autres, fait appel à ses services. Der Blog des US-Amerikaners gehört zu den populärsten innerhalb der Audio-, Unterhaltungs- und Informationsbranche. 2013 gründete Mark Ramsey das erste Audio Ideas Festival der Welt, Hevio. Und was die erfolgreichen Audiostrategien der Zukunft sind, darüber spricht er jetzt. We're very honored to have you here. Welcome, Mark Ramsey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the great honor of being here. I've got to tell you, it's, it's a real pleasure. All right. Um, what is the thing that most radio broadcasters are most fearful of? What's the thing most of us are most afraid of? It's this. It's being perceived as a commodity. What is a commodity? A commodity is something that can be found anywhere, right? It's stuff that, okay, we play music that you can hear anywhere. We're afraid of being a commodity. We have news you can get anywhere. What if we're a commodity? We have pop culture information that you might be able to get from any source. We might be a commodity, right? Isn't that the biggest fear that we're providing content that people can get from anywhere? Well, let's, let's think about this word commodity, what it means a little more deeply. This, for example, is a commodity. Coffee. Coffee beans are a commodity. They're traded as a commodity. Right? In the US, for example, a pound of Arabica coffee beans will run you $1.63 US. That's what a pound of coffee beans, a pound of the commodity costs in the US. Unless, of course, you buy it here, where that same pound is $12. That same pound, eight times more expensive. Why? It's because the brand called Starbucks wraps an experience around the product. It's the Starbucks experience, even the Starbucks here in the Forbidden City. It creates an experience wrapped around that product, the stuff that you experience when you walk into the Starbucks, the way you're treated, the conversations you have with people there, the events that are going on. All of that is the experience, and it's the experience that creates the value that takes something from commodity to extremely valued proposition. It's not just Starbucks. Other brands understand this, right? Apple certainly understands this. You've all had the experience. If you have an Apple product like I do, you open a new iPhone, you know the box that comes in right, you take the box, you try and open it, it won't open because it's made so perfectly that it won't even let air in, right? I hold the box like this in order to open it so that gravity lets the bottom of the box fall out into my hand. That's how perfectly those things are designed. That's part of the experience. It has nothing to do with the product itself. It has to do with the experience around the product. What about Uber? You're all familiar with Uber, I hope. Is it just transportation or is it a transportation experience? If I go to the corner, I can hail a cab. That's transportation. If I want Uber, I go to my app. I see all the little cars zooming around my area. I know exactly how far they are from me. I say I want one. Here's where I'm going. Here's the fair estimate. You watch the car approaching you. You see a picture of the driver, a picture of the car, right? The car arrives. You don't have to pay with a credit card. It's all taken care of. No tip required. It's all taken care of. At the end of the ride, you get to your destination, and you get a chance to rate the driver. And here's a little known secret. They get a chance to rate you. That is a transportation experience. Marvel, comics, movies, is that it? Or is it something larger, an experience? This was the scene several months ago at Disneyland in the US where 300 people were invited to dress as their favorite Marvel character in order to meet cast members from the movie. And this was the group picture from the event. That is an experience. That's bigger than the product alone. And it's not just events like that. Marvel, Marvel actually has a traveling exhibition called the Marvel Experience. Something 
is coming. The Marvel Experience. Now it's your turn to save the world. Who doesn't want to do that? Now that's an experience. So what is, and when I use this term, what do I mean? What is an experience? Okay, I'm going to give you a handy definition. You can think of an experience as the creation of memorable events for customers across platforms and in the real world. I want to break this down a little bit. Memorable events. We'll talk about that in a moment. Events. Things that happen. Okay? Memorable. Things that you remember. For customers. I'm not talking about listeners here. There's no such thing as listeners. There are consumers. There are customers. There are people with needs and appetites and desires. And our job is to satisfy those. Listener is just one dimension of who they are. Across platforms, in other words, the platforms they're interested in are the ones we should be interested in. in the, and in the real world. We often forget that the real world is where people actually spend most of their time, even still today. The fact that we are all gathered here today, even though theoretically we could see this experience online if we wanted to. At my Hyvio event, I live streamed the whole thing. We were in the top 10, top 20% of all live stream events for the year in terms of viewership. And yet it was also sold out because people wanted to be in the real world with the people in that room. Memorable events for customers across platforms and in the real world where the memory itself becomes the product. Think about that for a second. When you do a radio broadcast, it goes off into the air, it goes off into the air, and it's gone. A second later, it's gone. Radio is there. Radio doesn't exist. Unless you remember it. The memory itself is the product. If we're not creating things which are themselves memorable, there is no radio. There is no product. The memory itself becomes the product. Unconstrained by platform, which means you pick the platform, Mr. or Ms. Consumer. Whatever platform you want is the platform we will be creating content for. Engaging all the senses. This is important. The fact that we are audio first does not mean we're audio only. Nor should it mean we're audio only. We have five senses. We need to use them. So again, memorable events for customers across platforms and in the real world where the memory itself becomes the product, unconstrained by platform, engaging all the senses. All the senses. Experiences are sensational. Are we creating experiences which invite sight, sound, smell, touch, everything? Why does this matter? Because surveys show it matters a lot. Surveys show, for example, that 75% of millennials, this is from the U.S., say when it comes to money, experiences trump things. In other words, I prefer experiences over tangible things. Experiences trump things. People crave sensory experiences over products. That's from a 2013 study in the U.S. and the U.K. Another U.S. study, 81% of millennials, 79% of Gen Xers, 78% of baby boomers value experiences more than material items. More than material items. They value experiences. How do you create experiences? You do so by creating differentiated experiential value that is separate and distinct from the product or service. In other words, it's not the product, it's not the service, it's the thing that happens around the product or service, right? It's the, it's the box that contains the iPhone. It's the environment that is a Starbucks. It's the separate and distinct element around the product or service. This, by the way, brands recognize this. Your clients recognize this. This is why brands are becoming media, because brands realize that they can circumvent media and reach their consumers directly and create their own experiences. They can transform themselves into experiences. And they are doing exactly that today. For example, Red Bull, probably a client for many people in this room. Red Bull is, among other things, in the movie business. Red Bull is in the business of creating experiences. This, for example, is the trailer for a documentary they created about radio. Let me say that again. Red Bull, a client, creating a documentary about radio. Man, life in New York City in the 80s was crazy. Everything was happening, and everything was sort of bubbling underneath. TV wasn't doing it. All we had to grab onto in the 80s was a radio. 
that's how you got new music, that's how you knew what was going on. We learned how to make it sound like one big party. What you had in the 80s was you had people that were DJs on the radio, and they were the best in what they did. What we did was a re-edit or basically changing a song around. Of course, it was splicing with tape, a razor blade. The purpose was to take the most popular songs that were on the radio and have a different version for our station. First of all, you got to understand, this is the first time anything ever been done like that in New York City or anywhere else. It was fun, you know, as a kid, listening to this stuff happening, because these guys shaped the music industry. It shaped what we listen to today. A documentary about radio produced not by radio, but by a client of radio. Wrap your head around that for a second. Why didn't radio produce that, I wonder? This is uh, Robert Rose. Robert uh, was at my Hyvio conference in San Diego a couple of years ago, and uh, Robert works at, uh, is one of the lead people at the Content Marketing Institute, and he talked about how brands that he works with are uh, using content to create audiences of their own and market directly to those audiences, circumventing media companies, essentially becoming media companies. So Kraft right now has an opt-in email subscriber database of three and a half million people who, who basically subscribe to both the print and online version of Food and Family Magazine, which they produce and they publish and they create. So there's an online version of it and there's a print version of it. People pay for the print version of it. They have a marketing program that people pay for. Wrap your heads around that for a second. Now they have three and a half million opt-in email addresses. They actually have a bigger audience than uh, Food Magazine and Food TV Network. It would actually make more sense for Food TV Network to advertise with Kraft than the other way around. So, sorry for the lip sync issue there. Um, so his point is that clients are developing audiences. Clients are using content to create experiences that attract audiences and themselves becoming media companies. That's the value of experiences, even for your clients. Trevor Trena, who has a site called If Only, which auctions off once-in-a-lifetime uh, 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 prizes uh, to people for charity, said the entire marketing industry is moving to an experience-based economy. That's why even the research that I do for broadcast stations is now 360 degrees. It's not just what happens on the air, it's what happens in people's minds everywhere across all platforms. The thing that we need to grapple with to appreciate this is we need to begin by understanding that from the consumer standpoint, I, the consumer, am at the center of the universe. I am at the center of the universe. Very often at conferences, even like this, we talk about radio as if radio is at the center of the universe and listeners are out there. They are the people that we broadcast to. No, I am the center of the universe. This is how many broadcasters see the center of the universe. Big tower, little consumer. This is how the consumer sees the center of the universe. Very different. This is how Apple sees the center of the universe. You need to begin by understanding what are the challenges, the needs, the appetites, the desires, and the problems of consumers, and are we solving those? So that yields to the next section of this presentation, which is what I call 12 things we don't worry enough about. What are these 12 things? These are really 12 things designed to facilitate our ability to create incredible experiences to create more compelling, potent, impactful experiences for our consumers from now going forward. I'm going to take you through all 12. Beginning with, number one, interactive. You're familiar with the TV show The Voice. I know it exists in multiple countries. This is, from, this is the app from the US version of the show. The Voice, of course, not just a TV show. It is a television experience, an interactive television experience. Uh, if you've ever watched the show, you know that you can see the tweets up on the screen, tweeting from and to the people while the show's going on. Uh, it is in real time. It is live, like radio. So you get to participate with it and interact with it in real time. The app is interesting because the app takes it to a whole new level. The app doesn't just allow you to watch the show. In fact, the app doesn't allow you to watch it at all. The app allows you to participate with it, to interact with it. Um, the app allows you to turn your own virtual chair for whoever's on the stage and see what fraction of America turned their chair for this person along with you. The app allows you to 
um, to favorite your particular artists, to customize your experience for what you're watching on the show. The app allows you to vote at the beginning of the show for your favorite artist. When you watch the show, you can't vote till the end. So the app essentially makes you a VIP, a very important person. It makes you more important than other viewers of the show. And interestingly, you can suggest songs to your favorite artists to sing during the course of the show. So you are now a co-creator of the show. You're interacting and producing the show. That's interactivity. How should interactivity be for any given radio brand? It depends on the nature of the audience and the interaction those listeners, those fans, those consumers want to have with your brand. This is totally a different example from the San Diego Safari Park. I'm from San Diego. Uh, they had a, an attraction called the Tiger Trail, so they created an opportunity for people to upload their photos, make them into tigers, and of course, what would it be without sharing them in a gallery and sharing them with your friends? Sharing is obviously fundamental here. This is an interactive way of engaging people with the brand. If you are a collector of action figures, and I know you are, then you want to show off those action figures, right? What better way to show them off than to upload a photo of your action figure collection and show them off with other action figure fans? And that's what Sideshow Collectibles enables people to do. That's interactive. Here's how you sign up for it, and boom, it's as simple as that. Do Something is an organization with 3.6 million young people who, who independently put together projects that they see from beginning to end designed to make the world a better place, or at least make their corner of the world a better place. 3.6 million young people. That's interactive. Here are some examples of some of the campaigns these young people create. These young people are creating campaigns to make their world better in the presence of a brand they care about. What do you do? to enable your fans to create experiences in the presence of your brand. What do you do? Another thing they do, they have a crisis text line. Remember the days of telephone crisis lines, right? Call up the support line, get support. Nowadays, it's all about text. So, um, in fact, here's the information to, uh, to text. And over time, they've counseled more than 2 million, 2 million problems which is a big, big impact, making the world a better place for their fans and solving problems for their fans because their attitude is the consumer is the center of the universe. We do something or not. This is a, a, an app from uh, Clip Interactive designed for broadcasters, enabling all kinds of interaction, interaction with contests, interaction with sponsors, and a variety of other interactions. There are other types of platforms like this out there, but this is one example. Now, I said before, you need to use all the senses. This is from RTL in Italy. And as you may know, um, I don't know if RTL is here, but as you may know, you can either listen to the stream for RTL or you can watch the stream. And note when you watch the stream, that's the studio you're looking at. Too often you see cameras in a studio that looks like a radio studio. This is a studio dressed for television because when you put cameras in a studio, you are no longer making radio, you are making TV. Ara, complimenti, bravissimo. Ma chi arriva adesso? Ah, anche lei riempie gli stadi, e come? È Madonna con Ghost Town. So if you don't think sets matter, talk to people in television and they will convince you otherwise. The appearance of the video matters. So if you're going to attract all the senses, you need to speak to those senses in the ways they want to be spoken to, not just put a camera in a radio studio and hope for the best. All right, number two, personalized. This is kind of related to number one. This is an app from uh, Federated Media in the U.S. Um, this overlays on the radio station experience, and as you can see, allows you to customize the experience. This is a radio station, one radio station called My Bear. My Bear, meaning customized. Uh, with different uh, channels, essentially, that you can select. You can rate individual songs. You can fast forward. You can fast forward radio. There's an interesting thought. By the way, the biggest problem with radio is that you can't skip to the next song, right? That's what changing stations is. It's a workaround to the fact that I can't skip to the next song. This allows you to skip to the next song and still be in the same experience you started with. 
K-Love is America's largest Christian broadcaster, and their My K-Love app is not just an app to listen to the station. It's also an app designed, since it's Christian, it's designed to allow people to make prayer requests and to respond to those prayer requests so that you actually are making people feel like better human beings. You're fulfilling the mission of the brand in a way that has nothing to do with music or radio per se, but has everything to do with the consumer, the consumer at the center of the universe. Number three, on demand. This is something we're familiar with. I prefer on demand over podcasting, but it's the same thing. These are the statistics from the US that you may have seen before in growth in podcast uh, usage, uh, monthly uh, podcast usage since 2008. Right now it's around 17%, 18%, somewhere in that area. Um, the notion that podcast usage has exploded in the U.S. obviously is not correct. Just podcast attention has exploded in the U.S. Usage has grown gradually. Still, 70% is a lot. And in fact, it's so much that some of the public broadcasters have banded together and created podcast upfronts. This past year was the first podcast upfront. Or I think uh, iHeartMedia called theirs audio upfront. I wish they had called it Podfront, because I own that domain, I'd be happy to sell it to them for a nice, tidy sum. Um, podcast Upfront, you may know from television, Upfronts are where you gather together potential advertisers and show your slate of content for the year so as to get them to buy in uh, early. So now for the first time, there are podcast Upfronts in the U.S. That's amazing. I want to show you some examples of podcasts, good and bad, and I want to start with the bad. Okay? Um, this is obviously off iTunes, New Jersey 101.5 is New Jersey's number one news and information station on FM. And as you can see, they contribute one uh, newscast per day to uh, their iTunes feed. Uh, what do you call a radio station that's in the news and information business that uh, publishes one news update per day? You call it a newspaper. Great. Um, if you're going to dabble, don't waste your time. If you're going to invest, invest. Don't waste your time. If it's not important enough to you to do this properly, don't do it at all. It's embarrassing. And it's not useful to your consumers, even worse. I want to show you some more awful examples from the U.S. All the awful examples are from the U.S. Um, this is a page from uh, the webpage from WSB in Atlanta, leading one of America's largest markets, one of America's most important news and information stations in Atlanta. Show me on this page where the audio is. You're in the audio business. Hmm, where's, not the stream, the on-demand audio, where is it? Well, maybe it's behind media. Well, it turns out if you click on media, it, the drop-down says podcasts and photos because we all know if you're in the radio business, Photos are every bit as important as audio, right? No. Uh, so I click on podcasts. Where do I go? I go to this page, this really unadorned, ugly page, where all these podcasts are listed. Okay, let me pick Neil Bortz, Bortz Commentary, and here's what comes up when you click on that. Now, um, we all know when you search Google for something, you're not searching for Bortz Commentary 21215. You're searching for content, right? What's in this commentary? Who knows? Um, what does it mean, select your podcast tool? I don't care. Um, what does it mean, subscribe? I don't know. What is an RSS? I don't care. I don't want to click on what's RSS. By the way, how about a play button? Would it kill you to provide a play button? Something simple like that. This is just awful. So as we all know, Google uh, indexes text, right? Google doesn't index any of this. Nobody's going to find any of this. This is useless. This is a waste of time. So let me show you. Those are the horrible examples. Let me show you some better examples, starting with this from one, one of my clients in uh, San Francisco, KCBS, part of CBS. This is part of their Play It platform you may have heard of. And uh, so at least they have an audio tab up there. And when you click on the audio tab, you go here, which is their Play It platform filtered on San Francisco, the local market. Uh, so, fine, I'll click on John Madden, I go to John Madden, up pops some text, great, Google likes that. Um, a play button, a download button, some sharing uh, uh, icons, which is great. I understand this, right? This makes sense. This is easy. This I understand. 
Uh, this, of course, from SoundCloud. You're all familiar with SoundCloud. Really a terrific platform that has all this stuff down, has all the sharing down, has all the, the uh, metadata down. This is uh, my podcast, by the way, that I do with brand guru uh, Tom Asacker, which you might want to find on iTunes, Media Unplugged. Um, from Absolute Radio. A great example, very clean, very clear, very simple, right? Simple instructions. So let's click on one. We get more detail. It's actually text. That's awesome. Uh, the duration. So we click on that. Okay, a play button, download, easy, sharing tools, terrific, okay? Those are some examples. Um, number four, tastes. One of the mistakes we tend to make is that because tastes have always been something, they always will be that same something. The tastes, in other words, are static. They don't change, but that's not true. Tastes, in fact, do change because people come into the demo who were not in the demo, and people go out in the demo who have spent a lifetime in the demo. This is from the U.S. Population between 2000 and 2010. You can see the so-called baby boom there in purple in 2010. In 2000, it begins, the peak of the baby boom is around 40. In 2010, it's around 50, and we know which way this is going, right? Um, here it is, another picture that takes it all the way up to 2050. I'm going to be very old in 2050. Um, but you can see the boom keeps going up and up and up, and then you see what's behind it is no boom at all. It's just a constant, large mass of people, right? There's, a large, there's no more baby boom. So much of radio historically has been built by four the baby boom, the taste of the baby boom. There are consequences to this. The fact that the baby boom is vanishing from the 25 to 54 demo, and younger people are uh, filling in the gaps in large numbers, en masse. Let me illustrate some of this for you. The top 10 audio formats of 2014 in the US, according to Nielsen, were these. These are the top 10 audio formats nationwide in the US in 2014, among persons 25 to 54. This is what it looks like if you add them up and pretend they add to 100%. Just those top 10. Well, let's ask the question, how many of these are current music-based? 66% are current music-based, which means current music is an important component of the mix, if not the dominant component of the mix. Well, what happens when you take out the non-music formats, take out news talk, take out sports? 80% of the top 10 formats, according to Nielsen, 2554 in the US, are current music based. Think about that, current music based. What are the consequences of that? Well, first of all, any format which is targeted at the oldest end of the demo, which does not invite younger listeners, will disappear. It will age with the demo and vanish. So formats need to be concerned about that if they are purely gold. There will be no more new music formats. I don't mean new music, I mean new music formats. Why no more new music formats? Because in an age where anybody can hear anything they want, anywhere they want, they will. That means they're gonna to come to radio, not for every individual song that I like, but for every individual song everybody likes. In other words, radio will be the place where we all listen to what we agree on, where we all Hear the songs we love together the most. In other words, the hits, especially the more contemporary hits. So where are you going to find these new formats from? New formats require audiences with unmet needs that exist en masse. Electronic measurement in the U.S., PPM, has killed off niche formats. It's killed off smooth jazz. It's killed off formats like that that don't have a broad base of listeners. In fact, the best way to ratings, the best path to get ratings, under electronic measurement, under PPM, is to increase QM. And the best path to increase QM is to give most of the people 25 to 54 what they want most of the time, and that means more contemporary content, that means hits. All AC becomes hot AC, because the gold's gonna go away. And we see this in the US right now, is that the AC stations are drifting younger and younger and younger. Fewer music formats, period, because again, the niche music formats will vanish. Electronic measurement will kill them off. Um, 
So you're going to end up with fewer music formats, and you're going to end up with more competitors chasing those formats. Because with the same number of stations, fewer formats, that means more competitors chasing those formats. That's why in the US, we used to have one CHR per market. Now we have two, we have three. In some markets, we have four. And more non-music formats. Because it's not all about music, right? There are other categories of content out there. And that's what I want to talk about next, number five, beyond music. What do I mean by beyond music? Well, the fraction of non-music listenership will invariably increase because people are going to awaken to the fact that a lot of what the content out there is non-music content. Once we get beyond the hits, what's left? I asked the question in a survey that I conducted privately uh, about three years ago um, online, and I used all the categories that uh, iTunes uses, that Apple uses for their podcasts. And I said, what types of audio podcasts do you listen to? What is the consumption by category? And this is how it ranked from high to low. Comedy, news, politics, sports, recreation, technology, et cetera. Now, news and politics, we know those stations. Sports and recreation, we know those stations. Comedy, I don't know. Do we know those stations? How many of those stations are there? Technology, where are those stations? TV and film, where are those stations? There are categories out there that haven't been fully explored for radio that are non-music, and podcasting shows us where they are. Buzzworthy, number six, making content worth talking about. Um, I always like to use this example. One of my favorite platforms is Omaze. It's a contest platform, or is it? Omaze is a platform that allows you to bid on something, essentially buy your way into something by entering it in exchange for a chance to win something fabulous and help charity at the same time. Most of your listeners, the vast majority of your listeners, don't care about contests. They never participate in contests. You ask them, that's what they'll tell you. Why? Because I have one in a million chance of winning and 999,999 chances of losing. The odds are not in my favor. The odds are not in my favor. What if you could change those odds? That's what Omaze does. For example, this is a chance to win uh, a visit with George Clooney at the screening of his movie, Tomorrowland at Disney. Uh, you and a friend will just click enter to win. Here's what you'll do, and here's who you'll help. In other words, the fact of your entering helps a charity. You are a winner by entering. You are a winner by entering because you've done good for a charity. Now, entering costs. There is a free option for contest rules, but nobody uses it. Because if you pay something, you get something. And what you get may be very inexpensive. Um, support for $10, for $50, you get a digital thank you card, cost zero, right? For $100, you get a t-shirt and so on up the line. Here's an example of how Omaze works for uh, the Avengers. Hi, honey bunnies, quick question. Have you had the best night of your life ever on Earth yet? Well, you could, with me for a good cause. Here's the deal. You donate $10 or more for a chance to win the RDJ experience. I correspondingly fly you and a friend out to LA, put you up in a four-star hotel, and proceed to awesome the crap out of you. Talking indoor skydiving, helicopter tour, maybe a pit stop at Randy's Donuts. After riding your sugar high all the way to a fitting for a tux or gown, we're gonna meet up for a little pre-premiere caviar. One of those could be in your mouth. You giggle, chat, take pictures, perhaps even engage in a battle of wits? Kidding, or am I? Around about sunset, we make a grand entrance at the venue. You walk the red carpet, and then you become one of the first people on Earth to see Avengers, Age of Ultron. Even if you don't win, you still get all kinds of swag depending on your donation level. Plus, all proceeds go toward funding Julia's house. This place is amazing. It's a hospice center for children with terminal illnesses. It's a win-win. Go to omaze.com slash rdj for your chance to win. That's o-m-a-z-e dot com slash rdj. And lastly, to make this entirely irresistible, there's a button. Click on this. Give yourself a chance at a night you'll never forget. But remember, you don't have a chance at this unforgettable night if you don't sign up and donate. I don't remember where the button is. I forgot. Don't be like me. Actually, be like me and sign up for this unforgettable night that won't happen if you don't remember. <laughs> and it wasn't 
bad that last take, but it was 16 and a half minutes. Um, are people going to appreciate that when you post it? As Robert said, it's a win-win. I mean, that's important. How many contests are win-wins? And he used the term experience. Both of those should make an impact on you. Number seven, shareable. By the way, part of the Omaze thing, after, you're done, after you donate to it, you get the opportunity to share it. You get more... Uh, uh, you get an additional entry every time someone you know enters. So the sharing encourages participation, which encourages sharing, which encourages participation. Uh, to my view, we don't do nearly enough with sharing tools. We all want everybody to share our stuff. But do we want everybody to share it for their reasons? People share stuff for their reasons, not for yours. Are we giving them the things to share they want to share? or just the things we have on the menu. Again, sharing, an important part, obviously, of uh, SoundCloud. Um, here's a SoundCloud embed in a Hollywood Reporter story. This is from Howard Stern, so it's a radio show. Now, interesting thing about the sharing of audio. I'm going to make a generalization here, and the generalization is this. People generally don't share audio. They share the conversation about the audio. That is, if I say, hey, I heard something great on the radio this morning, somebody doesn't say to you, um, send it to me. No, they say, what did you hear? <laughs> right? The, again, that's the memory. That's the story. People share the conversation about the audio. The audio serves more as color, as backdrop, as supporting information. Right? Even here in this Hollywood Reporter story, if you notice, this is the very bottom of the story. The entire preceding part of the story is essentially a narration of the audio. It's a textual version of the audio. It's the part of the audio that Google will find, right? The audio itself is not an afterthought, but it's color. And it exists because that story exists, not the other way around. So obviously, highlights are more likely to be shared than long form, of course. But I'm telling you something. I did a I, I wrote a post that went viral a while back on a platform for movie fans. And there were two key metrics that they shared. One was the number of uh, reads, and the other was the number of shares. The number of reads my post had, the number of shares my post had. It had more than twice as many shares as reads. How does that happen? It happens because people are sharing the title. They're not sharing the content. They read the title. They shared it. They didn't bother to read it. Okay? Don't make people work so hard. Let people share the conversation about the audio. Don't force people to share the audio itself unless you're really confident it's worthwhile. Or at least if you have them share the audio, don't forget it's the story about the audio that they're more likely to share. And make sure you've got that covered. Number eight, user generated. We don't do enough with this either. Um, we have these huge, vast audiences, and yet, how often do we call on them to help us co-create our content? How often do they participate as producers in content? Hewlett Packard made a TV spot entirely of Vines. You're familiar with the platform Vine, right? Six-second videos. Here's what that spot looks like. Oh, oh, oh. So for a very small amount of money, they were able to go out there and find the people who are really good at creating Vine videos and recruit them to create videos for Hewlett Packard. What were the results? This is the summary. 30 Vine posts were commissioned, 950,000 active engagements, and 50 million organic views. Pretty good results. Here's another example. This one from Dyson. You can't read the small print here, but what Dyson's looking for are people who, are who have great experiences with Dyson vacuums to be in a TV commercial for Dyson. They're crowdsourcing the TV advertising for Dyson. They're looking for participation from their own fans, as we all should. One of my favorite examples was from the San Diego radio station 91X. I used to work in the building there at 91X years ago, and about 30 years ago, they did this thing called Expose the X, where they 
posted a contest reward of $10,000, and the winner would be the person who did the most creative job of exposing the 91X logo in and around town. I wish I could tell you I had video, but everybody I've talked to at 91X today says if it exists at all, it's on a VHS in a garage gathering dust, so nobody has video. But I do have, anecdotally, some of the examples of the things people did, and they are quite remarkable. Here are some examples. A pair of skydivers exposing a 91X sign while free-falling. A thousand high school students forming a 91X. A mock lost dog poster of a dog with polka dots forming 91X. One person painted her contact lenses with 91X. Body painting, balloons, sailboats, everything sporting logos. Audience members of a TV show that was on at the time exposed the logo when the camera panned to them during the opening sequence. In the Andy Williams Golf Open, in a shot where one uh, golfer gets an eagle, a 91X umbrella was strategically exposed during a shot he made that made the highlight clip of the day in the sports news segments. I remember seeing the video. Literally, the umbrella just went down like that, and boom, there was the logo. It was amazing. Three men in jet skis exposed the X when they all rose up in San Diego Bay, and the X was done. The logos were on the logos on the bottom of each of their um, jet skis. One fan tried to send a 91X into outer space with a cheap toy rocket. That probably didn't work. One guy hawked a 91X blimp. One guy projected a 91X, 91X logo all over town on, with a spotlight, even on two competing stations, which you gotta love. A 91X van, a 91X balloon display, a 91X flasher, ask your parents. A 91X rocks license plate. 91X cereal, a billboard, 91X shaved on a head, dental tattoos, I didn't know those existed, 91 eggs, et cetera, and my favorite one, TV star, American TV star at the time, Valerie Bertinelli, who was hosting a live episode of Saturday Night Live, when at the end of the episode, she put on a sweater emblazoned with a big 91X logo on live national television. That was for a $10,000 prize. It goes to show you what your fans will do, your fans who love you, if you ask them to show you how much. Do you ask? Number nine, smart. Here we're talking about the value of inventory, right? The beauty of being digital means you can overlay more data on the value of advertising and make it worth more. Smart audience data means smart inventory, and that requires more than anything registration. Zip code, age, gender, at a minimum, right? Here again, Absolute Radio. They do this quite well. Um, they have different, if you want access to their different uh, genre channels, you need to register. And by registering, you provide email, password. Uh, what are the uh, benefits besides that? Fewer ads, more music. Pretty compelling benefits. Fewer ads, but each one of those ads is more valuable. And it's sold for more to the advertiser, and it makes more money for the radio station. So it's a win-win it's a in the classic sense of the term. Real simple, the registration process. But do we invite registration in the US? A lot of radio stations are afraid of this. They're afraid, literally, that the value of registration won't justify the burden of registration. Meanwhile, Spotify, everybody registers. Pandora, everybody registers 100%. What are we afraid of? Number 10, community. I'm always surprised that, in some cases, our clients are more interested in building databases, lists, of their own consumers than we are. We're in the audience building business. And yet, how many of you have a really big list of your listeners available to you that you communicate with, that you know something about? Here's an effort from, the, again, that New Jersey 101.5 station to grow such a list. This is the pop-up on their website that you'll see if you go to visit the site. Um, sign up for our newsletter. Why? Oh, I don't know. Just, you know, just sign up. Who does that? You've got to give me a reason, right? People do things for their reasons, not for yours. Why should I sign up for your newsletter? By the way, is it even wise to call it a newsletter? Is that even right? What am I signing up for really and why? And then you put it below the like us on Facebook, which is worth next to nothing to you. We all know what the organic, uh, the, the organic distribution on Facebook is. It is swirling the drain of zero right now, organic distribution. In case anyone is confused, Facebook's business model is the same as yours to sell advertising. 
So people who don't buy advertising don't get distribution. Just like you wouldn't give distribution to them, they're not giving distribution. So by encouraging people to like you on Facebook at the exclusion of something that's more intimate, you're just uh, assisting Facebook in their business model. <clears throat> this is the pop-up on my site, by the way, which I intended to create with a little more value. Okay, 10 Ways of the Radio Ninja tells you what it is. There's a little bit of intrigue there. Looks like something I might want to sign up for. And oh, by the way, if it's irritating, you won't see it again for six months. Ning is a site that builds communities for brands, right? They build private communities, private Facebooks, if you will, for brands. For example, this is one for a, uh, a rock and roll radio station, Hair Metal Mansion. That's their community for fans of that brand. If you have listeners, if you have fans who have uniform interests, who have interests which make sense in the context of the brand, such that they want to be together in the context of the brand, you have a community in the making. Here's another example called beinggirl.com. This is for girls in the tween age, between uh, juvenile and teenagers. There are millions of girls signed up to beinggirl.com. This is a community with millions of members brought to you by Procter & Gamble. They own this community. They have more email addresses of girls in this age group than you do. They have more, and they are the client. This, by the way, is their pop-up. Note that it has all kinds of interesting things that actually invite you to register. First of all, it's not sign up for our newsletter. It's register. And they have reasons, attractions, benefits to registration because people do it for their reasons, not for yours. This is another example, Harley, one of the most famous, famous examples, the Harley Owners Group, a famous organization. This is the page for the Harley Owners Group. Harley has tons of their own consumers on an email database that they communicate with regularly. Note the emphasis on benefits here. It's all, the whole page membership benefits. Why should I join? Number 11, results. Okay, this is a 10-year prediction from uh, Gordon Burrell in the U.S. Gordon Burrell is a man whose business is local media in the U.S. This was his prediction for the U.S. that by 2024, here's what he said, car dashboard options diminish AM, FM radio listening, half the terrestrial radio stations disappear, only those with the strongest and most valuable audiences remain, smartphones become radios. Now, before I have to keep people in the U.S. from freaking out at this point. Um, First of all, we recognize that car dashboard options will diminish AM, FM radio listening. That we know, traditional listening. The second point, though, half the terrestrial radio stations disappear. This is where people go nuts. What you need to understand is that it's not that half the radio stations in the U.S. will disappear. It's that a large number of radio stations in the U.S. will cease to be relevant from a commercial advertising standpoint. If you're not relevant as a competitor for my ad dollars, you essentially have vanished, okay? So to the degree that stations will, for example, go out of the commercial radio business. There's a, uh, my, my uh, Christian non-commercial client just bought a classical music station in Florida, taking it, essentially making it disappear. They just took it non-commercial. So it could be a change in the business model. That's what he means by disappear, being less relevant from an advertising perspective. Only those with the strongest and most valuable audiences remain. This alludes to what we were talking about before. Fewer formats, more stations competing for those formats. Smartphones become radios, of course, we know. Now, here's what he said at the bottom. Here's what he said you need to do in order to anticipate and leverage this. Develop original content, of course. Original content, in other words, that is not commodity. Strengthen community relationships. Remember, he's talking to local radio stations here. Pick the most valuable audience format. That goes back to what I said to you earlier, right? Which is fewer formats, more stations competing for them. Master the radio social media marketing game. I thought, what is that? Master the radio social media marketing game. So I actually sent him an email. I asked him, I said, what do you mean, master the radio social media marketing game? Here's what he told me. This is him, Gordon. Radio is formed around affinities. Radio is the only local media with enough personal clout to get people to profess their affinity via a bumper sticker, the analog equivalent of a like. 
Have you ever thought about it that way? A bumper sticker is the analog equivalent of a like, right? And radio has those affinities. Radio has the power. Radio has fans. And when you have fans, you have people who will put a bumper sticker on a car, wear a T-shirt, put a window decal on. If radio can harness those affinities on air and drive listeners into digital social media to take action, then they'll really have something powerful. TV, newspapers, yellow pages can't affect that type of action. In other words, I'm not in love with my television station. I'm not in love with my newspaper. I'm not in love with the yellow pages, but I do love my radio station. So if my radio station can motivate me through on air and direct me to social media slash digital destinations to be monetized with my clients, that's a business model. That's a business model. And that's something unique to local radio. Number 12, finally, choice. We often think about choice wrong, I think. I think we, we, we worry about choice in the context of the dashboard, right? The car dash. We worry about not getting the pole position, not being up front, not being easy to find, not being as likely to be consumed. Here's the thing we need to recognize, that the, the thing about choice is that choice itself is not the problem. The problem is that you need to be worth seeking out. That which is worth seeking out thrives in a context of choice. If you go into a supermarket, you see millions of products lining those shelves, yet every single category has a leader. And you don't hear Kellogg's complaining about the number of products in the supermarket. No, Kellogg's is more interested in having a product people want to buy. Be worth seeking out. If you are worth seeking out, consumers will seek you out no matter what the dashboard looks like. Here, for example, is the new Ford Sync that's out this summer. Um, and this is the one shot of the screen that's going to show the radio station. So which of you is going to keep people from using all that functionality? We can't, right? What can we do about the new dashboard? The answer is nothing. Here's what we can do. We can be worth seeking out in the context of that dashboard, no matter what's on that dash. So take your own station, put it in the first column. Take the other competitors, put them in the other columns, and just go through the list of pros and cons by category. Here are the commercials. Do we do well or poorly? Here's the, do we have a star as a personality? Do we have that or not? Features and functions, one after the next after the next. Just go through the laundry list. What makes us unique? What makes us special? What makes us must hear? We're leaving the world of push and entering the world of pull. All you have to be is desirable enough to be worthy. So these, again, are the 12 things that can help us create more compelling, potent, powerful experiences so as to engage and attract our audiences here, now, today, and well into the future, regardless of where technology takes us and what technology becomes. With that, I thank you.